Well, good morning, everybody. Before we get rolling in the celebration, like the proclamation out there on the banner, can we just all join together and say, He is risen. He is risen. I think we could do better. Let's do it this way. If you're over the age of 20, say, He is risen. He is risen. All right, for all the kids, can you help me out now? You ready? He is risen. He is risen. That's joy. That's joy. So I need your help today, kids. Instead of going downstairs with Miss Andressa, can you stay here? Can you help me today in today's sermon? Because today is all about joy. Look in the top hat. You're going to help me out today. Now, here's the thing. I don't care if you got a fidget. I don't care if you have to talk. I just need you to pay attention because every once in a while, I'm going to point to you. Every time I say he is risen, and I want you to say he is risen. Is that okay? Can you help me? Like yell it with joy. We got to get these older people joyful because we're talking about joy beyond the empty tomb. So before we start, can we, can we all pray together? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this morning, Lord God, that no matter what we're going through, no matter what we left, as we left our home this morning, we can declare like your servant Job, I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the last, he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has thus been destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me, Lord God, but it will faint with joy, gladness. As we stand before you with the righteousness of your Son as our clothing, Lord God, as we hear a greeting from you, as a father to his child, Lord God, welcome in his home. Praise you, God, because we love you for this hope. We love you for this faith, and we love you because you are you. I thank you for all that are here today, Lord God. You are so awesome. And you are risen. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. All right. So this morning we're going to be looking at this. We're taking, we're pausing from John just for a moment to look at the resurrection. We're going to be looking at Matthew 28, starting in verse 1. And kids, you're going to be up, so get ready. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. One more time. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen. He is risen. Yes. Man, I like that. From the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said to them, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet, and they worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Can we imagine the joy of those women as they came upon that empty tomb? To clearly understand this, we have to understand the grief that they experienced before that. Now, a few of us got together on Friday night, and I know it was billed as a church service, and if you showed up for that, sorry, you kind of duped. It was more of a sitting shiva with the grieving. It was a processing of, of the pain and the loss that those 
that were there had experienced the pain and the loss that was the price that was paid for the free gift that we receive. You see, in order to understand the value of this gift, although it's free to us, we need to understand that the cost was great. The cost was huge. The cost was paid by the only one that could pay that cost. Now, this weekend was a roller coaster of emotions for the disciples. That tremendous grief that they experienced was as much of a teaching lesson as the faith that came with seeing the risen Savior and a tremendous joy that welled up within their hearts. Because this is not a Resurrection Sunday. This is a Resurrection Sunday and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday because our God, He lives. He lives. But this is a tremendous teaching lesson. And, and the Bible does this often with contrasting words and statements. The idea of comparing darkness to light is so that we truly understand light in reflection of the darkness. It, it takes away the subjectivity of the word. So the idea of experiencing true joy needs to be seen through the eyes of those that experience firsthand the true loss of what it looked like to be staring at Jesus upon that cross. They were experiencing tremendous grief, and the grief was being fed by fear, as grief often is. As we're grieving somebody, there's a tremendous amount of fear that's going on into that situation, fear of the unknown, fear that life will never be the same, fear of everything that we lost. Now understand that that. These disciples, they weren't grieving the historical Jesus that we read about in Scripture. They were grieving a friend with which they loved, that they grew in relationship with. John says that which we have seen, that which we have laid our eyes upon, that which we have touched. The night before, John reclined upon the Lord's chest as they ate their supper together. They dipped bread together. They shared a meal. This friend so humbled himself that he washed the feet of the disciples. It was not words on a page that we read. It was their life. It was their experience. It was their friend. But he wasn't just an equal friend. No. On top of that, he was a rabbi that walked with them day and night, and he taught them. He taught them about life through the eyes of Scripture. He taught them how to process life, how that they should act. Most of all, he shared that life with them. But not only was he a rabbi, through the, the revelation that we read about in Scripture, through the, the, the miracles, through the signs that Jesus performed, they came to the understanding that this indeed was the Messiah. That which was the hope of Israel. That which was the hope of the world. So look at the loss through that. As they sat there and they looked at Jesus hanging upon that cross, they were looking at not historical Jesus. They were looking at their friend. They were looking at their love their true prize hanging on that cross. They were looking at the man that spoke truth into their life, and they were looking at God the Messiah that came to redeem them. Imagine the fear that was in them at that moment. Was the Messiah defeated? Now, Jesus said that this would, ha would happen. That's true. But what did it mean? They understood that, that he was of God. He was from God. He was one with God by his word. Well, does this mean that God was not able to stop this? As they sat there and, and, and they heard, so also the chief priests with the scribes and the elders mocked him, saying, he saved others and he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now. How much did that feed their grief and feed their fear? See, the, the crucifixion itself is also a contrasting statement. Upon that cross, we see 
the outpouring of the absolute love of God, which they may not have understood at that moment. It wasn't a time to process theology. It was a time to mourn. But that was a symbol of the absolute love of God in contrast with the absolute hatred, the absolute enmity within man's heart toward God and toward God's creation. And, and just think about this for a minute. Crucifixion being the most barbaric way that you can imagine to suffocate someone to death. But that wasn't enough. No, we need to beat him first. What goes on in a person's mind to come up with something like that? Now, not only was the institution of crucifixion a mirror into man's heart as to how man would treat man and man would punish man to, in, in civil infractions and sinning against them. But it also became normative. I want you to imagine that for the longest time, these, these people would walk down the street and, and the sound of people wailing and suffocating, that would become white noise in the background. Maybe they can even justify it. Maybe they could say, well, you know what? We know that one guy, his infraction was stealing. The thief on the cross. Well, if he didn't steal, he wouldn't be there. We can easily justify it until that loss affects us deeply. The cross was a symbol of fear. But what if upon that cross hung a man that had no civil infraction? What if upon that cross there came a man that had no sin? And what if upon that cross hung a man that not only did he not have civil infraction or not only did he not commit a sin, but he came to heal, to feed, to restore, to cast out demons? He came to forgive. Could we then look upon that and see the evil that that, that cross is? Can we see the atrocity of the sin that's within our heart and not able to forgive, to restore? For those that loved him, that grief tore them down. For those that it was revealed to them that this is indeed the Christ, the Messiah, they mourned. As the prophet Zechariah said, and I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. Now, that is the darkness. Now, here is the light, the resurrection, the empty tomb. For those that loved him, acknowledged him, and worshipped him as Messiah, there was no longer fear. There was no longer grieving. There was a little bit of fear, but there was great joy. The first thing the angel says to the women, do not fear. Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. But he is not here. What is he, kids? He's risen. Yes. Come and see the place where he lay. That tomb is empty. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that. Oh, my goodness. Come on. It's falling apart. Yes. That is the joy. That is the joy and the most beautiful thing. So these women are still afraid. What does the empty tomb mean? What does it prove? They need to hear affirmation from the Lord himself. And it says, Jesus meets them and says, greetings. And I love this because this is not a typical Jewish greeting. This is not shalom. This is not peace. This is, this is an embrace, a warmness, how you would greet somebody that you love, that you have relationship with. Jesus says to them, greetings. And they came up and they took hold of his feet and they worshiped him. And Jesus said, do not be afraid. Jesus, the Lord, the Messiah, the one who was crucified and is now risen, is the only one who can literally speak into the fear of a man or a woman's heart and say, do not be afraid because of what he accomplished. And he showed that to him. He showed that to him. He assured it to him. Do not be afraid. 
So for these women that left the tomb with fear and great joy, when Jesus took away the fear, what were they left with? Great joy. Excellent. You got another part. So that was the contrast between grief and joy that man experienced. But there's one more contrast between grief and joy that I think we should really look at and process, and that's the grief and joy of God himself. Now, there was no fear in God. God is in control. But we can never understand the grieving of our God as he looked upon the sin of man. As Jesus was hung upon that cross, as Jesus laid in that tomb, God had never intended a tomb to be part of our story at all. Nevertheless, his son laying in that tomb. God had intended us to, to have life. He created man in his image. And as he stepped back and he saw man having dominion over his image and, and, and over his creation and, and doing it so in his image, he stepped back and he said, this is very good. And he placed that man within a garden that was within Eden. And within that garden, he gave them two trees. And one tree is, is the tree of life, where you'll never see a tomb. There'll never be pain. There'll never be crucifixion. There'll never be man's idea of how to subjectively handle sin because there will not be any sin because we're going to trust in God 100%. We're going to focus on him and we're going to live in his will. And the other one, well, that's man's choice. And that's what man chose. If we look at the grieving of God that took place, we see in Genesis 6, the Lord, the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on earth and it grieved him to his heart. It grieved him to his heart. That is the grief of God. That man could look on another man and have evil intentions toward his creation. When we look at the grief of the father, we have to understand that the grief of the son was just as great. As Jesus hung upon that cross, we see for the first time Jesus speaking of the separation, the non-oneness of God as he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He cried out. We see, if we look in Psalm 22, the aloneness of the Lord that he was experiencing at that time. Lord God, why have you forsaken your son? Because as Paul writes, for while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. He did it for us. Why? Why? As the author of Hebrews writes, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus did that for the joy that would come. Now understand, the joy was not him sitting on a throne. He was on the throne, but he decided to come down out of love. He decided to come down and redeem his creation. The joy that Jesus is experiencing comes through the new creation that once again, he could sit back and say, this is very good. This is very good. So as we come together today and we look at the joy of the risen Savior, because kids, what is he? He's risen! It's a joy that we share with the Father because through his crucifixion and through his resurrection, we share eternal life. Our joy is once again at one with the Father. As Jesus prayed in John 17, let them be one as you and I are one. I and you and you and me. We are sharing not just the joy of the flesh, we are sharing a joy of the Spirit that is joined together once again in communion with God. 
That's not a, that's not a Sunday joy. That's a 24-7, 365-day joy. One of the scriptures that I think speaks to this in, in my heart is this Paul writes to the church in Corinth, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope only in this life, we are all, of all people to be most pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised. Kids, he is risen. we're losing it a little bit. He is risen. One more time, everybody. He is risen. Man, that feels good. From the dead, the first fruits of many who have fallen asleep. Guys, as we go through this week, this isn't a joy of one day of wearing pastels, enjoying the sun. This is the first step into eternity of sharing the joy with God, the joy that God has given us, that he has enabled in us, and the, the joy that he is experiencing himself at this right moment as we all join together with hearts that beat for him. As he sits back and he looks at his new creation, he says, this is very good. What is he, kids? He is risen indeed. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord God, I thank you for the voices of these children. It is no wonder that you had said, unless we humble ourselves like these, we shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. What joy you must have as your name rose off these kids' lips with solid faith and joy in their heart. Lord God, give us the grace of experiencing that joy as well, not just for today but for today and tomorrow until we come into your presence and as we bask in your glory. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son. Jesus, our Lord, we thank you for giving us affirmation that you are risen. Amen.